It has sold more than 25 million copies in America alone. It included arguably the most celebrated rock anthem of all time, Stairway to Heaven. And yet nobody actually knows what to call it. Is it Led Zeppelin IV, or the Runes album, or Four Symbols? That depends on who you speak to. But there's no question that Led Zeppelin's fourth album, released in 1971, was the one that took the band beyond rock god status, turning them into social icons. At the end of 1970, Led Zeppelin were really at a, a great peak in their career as far as the public were concerned, but a bit of a trough personally, because they were so exhausted after a, almost two years of non-stop touring. At the time of recording the fourth album, uh, Zepp were probably pretty tired from all the touring they've been doing in America, so there may have been some tension there. Obviously the first three albums had really um, established them <clears throat> worldwide. They'd worked at a very fast pace and I think when they get to Zep 4 it was the first time they'd really taken stock and worked to their own pace. They'd done six tours of America, they'd had three platinum albums, absolutely massive. Arguably, they were the biggest live rock band on the planet at that particular time. Woman! 26,000 larynxes. Woman! 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 In their careers, Zeppelin were, were huge when they started recording for, you know, successful sellout tours of America, successful sellout tours of this country, uh, three, three albums behind them. Uh, but what, what made it quite interesting was the fact that uh, the press had been quite critical about Led Zeppelin 3 in this country. You know, if you've listened to all the albums, you'll, you'll be able to listen to something and say, that sounds like Zeppelin, because mm. it's a sound, you know. Yeah. But in actual fact, each album is very different. There's a lot of different things on each one. Yeah. And I thought 3 was especially different from 1 and 2, which were basically very heavy sort of mm. music. Mm. And there's a lot of acoustic stuff on 3. Yeah. The third album had been received with a little bit of disdain, even by their hardcore fans over here, uh, because a lot of people considered it a little bit too folky. Zeppelin 3. Um, tend to get branded as one of the more folky albums. It had a lot of more sort of guitar-y, sort of pentangly, folky, um, rhythmic um, tracks on it. There was no restraint with the whole idea of being with or without an amplifier. I mean, we just did it whatever we wanted to do. They desperately wanted to do something to appease the British media and more more to the point they wanted they wanted to make their stamp on the UK. I think up to that point everything had been a whirlwind from 68 when they formed to 71 and it was the first time I think they all took stock and that's why the album comes out in a very measured way. I used to get music papers and things like that and in the end I I didn't get them because they had this policy that you were God one minute and get the next, you know, and that's the way that they, you know, to keep the paper going and controversy and stuff, you know. And in the end I thought, I said, trash, I'm not going to bother to read this, I'd rather listen. The album came off the back of the mysterious and slightly more folky Led Zeppelin III and took everyone by surprise. But why? What was the incredible magic that seems, to this day, to seep through the music? It's a combination of myth, 
paganism and alternative passions that fuse together with powerful, inspiring, libido-led music to create one of the ultimate albums. Hey, mama, sit the way you move, gonna make you sweat, gonna make you cool. Never once to take the easy path, the band decided to use the Rolling Stones' mobile studio, installing it in the forbidding Victorian grandeur of Headley Grange in Hampshire. Because it was open plan, I think the sound that Page wanted quickly you know, became apparent. He, he wanted a vast, expansive sound, which that album has got. And again, it was down to him as a studio craftsman, which he is. He knows the sound he wants to hear. You know, the, the way I see recording is to try and capture the sound of the room, the vibe, and the emotion of the whole moment, uh, and try and convey that across. You know, that, that, that's the very essence of it. Um, and so, consequently, you've really got to capture as much of the room sound as possible. You don't like anybody in the studio when you're putting a guitar, do you? No. I usually, I usually just limber up for a while and then do maybe three solos and take the best of the three. Yeah. They took it out of the studio because I think they felt that the studio compressed them a little. I think, you know, within four walls um, of a studio, there was only so much they could do. It's incredulous that Jimmy Page has gone down as saying that he actually used to get nervous in the studio. When you consider the amount of sessions that the guy played on, uh, I suppose now it was him, now it was Led Zeppelin, you know, and it wasn't just some fruitcake pop record that he was playing on, that he had to deliver. He has been stated as saying that he, he got a little bit jittery in the normal studio environment. Um, so it was natural for them to go somewhere where they felt comfortable, where they could take breaks as and when they wanted without looking at a clock ticking. It was the beginning of quite a few acts that did that, and I think Zeppelin was quite a pioneer of that. They actually got the idea from Fleetwood Mac. I think Fleetwood Mac were the first people to go into Headley Grange. But it set a precedent, really. But I think the reason it worked so well was because they were able to spend a whole week, you know, literally ensconced in the place, but it wasn't all about recording, you know, it wasn't there's a studio time two till four, it was we'll go in when we want to go in. If we want to go in at seven we'll do it, if we want to do it at two in the morning we'll do it. And I think a lot of the music came out in a very relaxed way because of that lack of discipline. Headley Grange wasn't exactly the most welcoming of locations. When they arrived at the place it was December 1970 and the harsh weather had set in. The house was freezing, so in true rock star style, the band decided to burn what remained of the banisters. In fact, they'd already done something similar on a previous visit. A damp and creepy place, and Andy Johns, who was to engineer the record, maintained that it was haunted. I think part of the reason they chose it was, I think because it was haunted, I think Jimmy Page in particular rather liked the idea of creating this somewhat spooky atmosphere, which certainly imbued a lot of Zepp's early recordings. He always felt there was quite strong sort of cosmological forces at work within Zeppelin. I mean, at that period in rock music anyway, there was quite a strong undercurrent of mysticism. And it was all new, it was all being discovered and talked about for the first time. So it wasn't like a kind of pretentious sort of um, publicity stunt <laughs> by any means. These were just ideas and thoughts and feelings that young musicians had at the time. And uh, that was kind of search, maybe our quest for um, something different in life, some explanation for life was um, quite crucial, I think, to the creation of the music. So it wasn't just a great big commercial enterprise, Led Zeppelin. There was a lot of deep stuff going on as well. It's incredible to take note of the fact that they only spent six days there when recording the fourth album, um, which must count as some of the six most productive days ever in the history of rock. Black Dog is a rather a very powerful introduction to Led Zeppelin IV. 
I think they're almost deliberately making this very positive statement because the previous third album had been uh, not criticised but slightly uh, disappointing for some fans who felt it was too too much uh, towards acoustic music. They'd made an acoustic statement on that album and Black Dog was really saying we're back, we're sexy, we're loud, we're, we are Led Zeppelin. The song began with the sound of Page's guitar warming up, which most bands would have instantly cut out of the final mix. Not this lot. Why not invite the listener into the inner circle by giving them a peek of Led Zeppelin preparing to perform? Well, Led Zeppelin was very much a live act. Let's face it, you know, they were one of the greatest live acts of all time. And I think every time they went into the studio or went to record an album, wherever it was, there was an edginess that was in them from playing live that they wanted to bring to the recording. I really do believe that if you leave a counting on a track, um, uh, and I used to do this with Quo a hell of a lot, if, if you leave the end a little bit ragged, somehow it takes the listener there to the environment. It's not this disembodied piece of music that just has a nicely edited beginning and a nicely edited end. And those little bits of, of supposedly outtake, just give it a, it's like a little bit of fresh air. It's like a bit of reality. Oh. They're not that, per oh, it just, to me, I never even thought they were outtakes. I just thought they're right, that's part of the track. It's, it's humanity, it's what happened at the time. If you listen to the start of Black Dog, you can hear the sound of the tape machine starting up, just whirring as the machine was put into record. Uh, you can hear what Page later called his guitar army, his scrubbing the guitar and getting ready to rock. And so, it's, it's, it's a, a, I just think they, they did it because they could. I think the whole thing of Zep4 is a band having great fun and that's one of you know the key attributes of that album. You know, they're really having a blast. You do message songs. What what is the message that, that you're trying to get across? It's sort of a message of enjoyment, you know. The whole the whole idea of, of music from the beginning of time was for, for people to, you know, be happy. If Black Dog isn't a musical, come on, <laughs> then I don't know what is. It has to be um, one of the most direct set of lyrics in rock as far as um, describing what you'd like to do when you get that woman home. Black Dog, hang on a second. I think I have those lyrics here. <laughs> Hey, hey, mama, said the way you move, going to make you sweat, going to make you groove. Going to make you sting. I mean, for God's sake, that's almost like sexually transmitted disease spiel at its best, isn't it, really? Um, it, it, brutal. Well, in this house, this Hedley Grange, there was a, there was an old black dog there, and it, and it uh, one night it went off because it, it was really it was really quite old, and uh, one night obviously been off you know doing the things that dogs do, <laughs> and came back and slept all day, and you know it just it was it was quite a powerful image at the time, <laughs> so we called it Black Dog. It's a very bold statement, and uh, starting off, kicking off with Robert Plant in full voice, screaming and shouting <laughs> in time of fashion, and uh, you know, being answered in in the way that Plant and Page did. Uh, that was their kind of uh, 
showpiece really was the way that they worked like a traditional blues act call and response is the phrase and that's what they did in that piece What is important about the song is that classic riff that has totally screwed up so many guitar players uh, from then till the present day. Uh, it even screwed up John Bonham apparently for a while until he sussed that I can just grip my teeth and regardless of what those buggers are doing, I can just play fours all the way through it. And the riff was an impossible riff. It, it had three, four time, it had four, four time. You know, no other band could go away and actually do that riff. It was unique. And when you heard it, it didn't stack up. But for some reason, Page made it work. You have a, a riff fighting against another beat. But because everything is separated into crotchets, so one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, eventually everybody comes back together. So for a moment in the riff, everybody's drifting around, floating around each other, and then they all lock in again. And then you've got the solo at the end of the track. I mean, it's a complete Led Zeppelin, you know, yardstick. It is a Led Zeppelin yardstick. And I think, again, it says everything about the fun they were having. It was relaxed, it was spontaneous. You know, they knew where they wanted to come from. They had a few templates, but nobody really knew where it would end up. You know, and Black Dog is a track that just ends up spiraling off into the sunset, which is fantastic. Page and Jones, the band's two studio masters, explored every nook and cranny of the house in order to get the maximum sounds. They set up Bonham's drum kit in all sorts of strange places, including the hallway. The whole situation was fraught with spontaneity. The unmistakable groove of rock and roll happened thanks to one of those happy accidents that only seem to occur with the true greats. I don't think Led Zeppelin set out to be a blatantly experimental band in the way, say, like King Crimson or even Emerson, Lake and Palmer or any of the progressive rock groups were. Um, they didn't make a great thing about it. At heart, they were a rock and roll band. They played blues, they played traditional rock and roll. Uh, but at the same time, they did um, set out to uh, incorporate new ideas in the studio. They would use whatever was lying around. They would experiment with the drum sounds. And in a place like Headley Grange with a mobile truck, we're not talking about in London at one of the then state-of-the-art studios, we're talking about a damp, cold, old house with a recording truck outside. Uh, I'm all in favour of recording trucks, but, but back then they weren't as sophisticated as they are now. And some of the effects and things that they got out of what was available to them then was quite astonishing. Page had always been one, one to try anything out. The violin bow is a classic thing, the violin bow on a guitar, uh, which he made a, a stage feature.
They did experiment, but not in a pretentious, self-conscious sort of way. It's, uh, it was a matter of bringing in new ideas all the time into each piece and to, to see if it would work. Their experimentation was quite tastefully done, I always thought. <laughs> Rock and roll is, is uh, again, if you saw Zeppelin live when they were using it as the, uh, the first song, the intro song, uh, it was just like watching four animals being unleashed from cages. And it was, the, it was the, you know, the, the, perfect, the perfect way to start a set. Rock and roll was uh, rather like Black Dog said, this is Led Zeppelin back, powerful and heavy. Rock and roll was also saying, this is Led Zeppelin, traditional Led Zeppelin. We know all about rock and roll music. This is what we were brought up on. Because there was always a certain element of snobbishness maybe emanating from traditional rock and roll fans. You saw bands like The Who and Zeppelin as young usurpers, really. It didn't take them terribly seriously. Jimmy Page um, was always big on, you know, the 50s guitar heroes, you know, James Burton, Scotty Moore, Plant loved uh, Little Richard, so did Bonham. It, it was a throwback to the 50s. And of course it kicks off with this uh, famed drum introduction that John Bonham plays, which is like the hi-hat and the snare drum kicks the whole thing into touch. <laughs> They were working on the track Four Sticks, which was just not coming together. And John Bonham went off into this doodle, which was basically the drum part for Keep A Knockin' by Little Richard. Page instinctively fell into the riff. They recorded about 12 seconds of it and it broke down. But then they thought, hey, we've got something here. So Four Sticks was temporarily shelved and they went on recorded rock and roll. recorded in 15 minutes flat and that's fact it's not a myth within 15 minutes of having the idea bang down you know no six months in the studio then you know that's rock and roll some of the best rock tracks ever have been recorded as quickly as that You only hear a few bars and you're pulled into it. It's an arrangement. Not many rock bands can do arrangements, which means actually changing the volume and the tempo and the pace and varying the instruments. Most bands go from A to B and it's loud at the beginning and loud at the end. So. Nobody knew and they didn't know that it was going to have the effect it did. You've got a lyric that can be interpreted any way you like. It was probably the one that got a lot of attention, but it wasn't, you know, the holy grail. That took a while. What is it about? 
I think because of the way he writes, he manages to retain an air of mystery. It just was the last track on side one, but it, it obviously became a lot more than the last track on side one over the years. I think it is the perfect arrangement. Although it's an eight minute song, the build is absolutely magical. And there's a, a funny thing that happens when you hear it on the radio or a mate plays it again. At first you think, oh no, not Stairway to Heaven again. And almost in spite of yourself, you find yourself getting drawn into it and it finishes and you think, yeah, that's great. And yet you start out thinking, if I never hear that song again, I'll be perfectly happy. It's um, it's a haunting sound. But it didn't sound um, stilted, or it wasn't struggling. I mean, so much progressive rock, which went on for about 17 minutes of a double album, maybe, would become you know, exhausting and uh, lose its way. Whereas Stairway to Heaven, the reason it's so successful, I think, it works like a little compact piece of classical music. It's probably um, one of the most famous pieces of music in, in rock history. We can clearly see in this big romantic theme there are um, clear echoes of the, the romantic school uh, of composition. It owes uh, a great debt to Beethoven and Mendelssohn composers like that. Uh, and rhythmically, it's very, very close to J.S. Bach's famous prelude from the Preludes and Fugues. Uh, both pieces are strikingly similar in many respects, both written in C major, uh, both 4-4 four, four time, very similar construction in terms of the melody. And it's also interesting in that the Jimmy Page uh, employs the device of the sharpened F. And it's this unexpected F sharp that, that, that makes the the melodic shift in the whole piece. And Jimmy Page introduces that much earlier into Stairway to Heaven, but it's very similar to the kind of call and response structure of the Bach piece with his. So you can see how the, the two pieces are, are very closely related. The Prelude and Fugue is quite widely used in rock music, uh, Proko Harum, uh, famously employed it, as did uh, Richie Blackmore and Rainbow on a, on a number of occasions. So you'll find it quite frequent, and its it, its influence for me is definitely there in Stairway to Heaven. It really built a little bit like the Zeppelin sort of mystique built through the years, and it was through being played live that it acclaimed the status that it did, you know, and then it became a millstone around their neck in the end. But early on, and in the context of the album, and the great thing about it now, is that because it's been much maligned, and you know, Rolf Harris and all this, when you play it now, and, and if you dare to play it, and that's what, you know, it's almost a fear factor, oh, it's Stairway to Heaven, I don't play that track anymore. When you do play it, it's still a song of great beauty. It may not be the, you know, the best thing on the album, but it's a song of great beauty and it has a lasting effect.
the amount of analysis that's gone on, the amount of web chat rooms, the amount of books that have been written just about the meaning of the lyrics is absolutely total and utter bollocks, if you like. What's it about? Lyrical searching, yeah. Um, does it make much sense? Possibly does to plant. Did it really matter? Probably not. If you want to interpret lyrics in a certain way and it gives you some inner meaning, you bought the material, then that's absolutely fine. And even if you discount the lyrics, which are whatever they are, they are, it's a lovely melody, one of the most lasting melodies of any rock song. Um, and then, you know, the inventive sort of guitar solo at the end, one of the most inventive guitar solos ever, ever. It's again, it's one of these songs where if you have a moment with either someone else or, or just a moment where you're watching the sunrise or something, it's one of those moments that this piece of music, if it connects, it's going to connect fully into every vein you've got going and make something inside, your, your, your little atoms are stirred by it, your, your being. It's one of those songs that actually connects with your being. I still have a very, very, very big place for Stairway to Heaven in my life. Of course, there was more to the record than just the music. The album cover has created so much interest and interpretation over the years. The band wanted it to be released without any reference to a title or their name. Commercial suicide screamed their label Atlantic. So Zeppelin decided to compromise. However, when this band compromised, it was never anything other than fascinating, not to mention challenging. There were record company problems when the record came out. The fact there was no title on the, the cover. It didn't say Led Zeppelin anywhere on the outer sleeve of the album, which caused panic and confusion at Atlantic Records, particularly in America, where they thought, what are these guys doing? How are we going to sell an album with no name on the cover? You've got to have Led Zeppelin on the cover. There was absolutely no handle for it. There was no band name. There wasn't even a catalogue number. Um, people at the record company called it commercial suicide. I knew that we were getting a lot of hammerings from different people. The critics, they were saying, oh, it's a hype, it's a hype, it's a hype. And that is the reason why on the fourth album there's no title on it. She so said, you know, might just as well, well if, they, if they say it's a hype, well, then this is a good way of saying it isn't a hype by untitling it and saying, well, here we are, you know. It's not being sold by the name of the band, it's the content of the material. I'm sure Peter Grant probably worried a bit about it, their manager, their all-powerful manager, but he would go along with anything that Jimmy Page su suggested. Got to give him his due. He stuck out for the band. He, you know, he dug his heels in and that was it. It got to a, a standoff where they were withholding the master tapes. They would not deliver the master tapes until the record company relented. And then the record company saw that there was a clause in the contract giving Zepp complete creative control over their sleeves uh, and everything else. I remember being in the in at the Atlantic office there with a the lawyer for two hours while he kept bringing out all these books saying, you've got to have that. I said, all right then, if that's what you want to do, then rerun it on the inside bag here, on the inside of the... Uh, print, print, your, print your Rockefeller Plaza or whatever it is down there. Well, of course, they didn't want to have to do a rerun on it, so it went out like this. And so the record company had to go along with it. And I think the, the thought was that the group was then so powerful, so famous and successful, that you didn't need to put the name of the... Uh, <laughs> the band on the cover. People would just go to this shop and say, I want the new Led Zeppelin album, and they, they'd know which one it was because it's the album without any name on the cover. So only a few bands could possibly ever get away with that. This was, they were said, professional suicide uh, to, to release an album with, with no nothing on it whatsoever, um, apart from the symbols and 
What do those symbols mean? There's been a lot written about the four signs. Uh, Paige said to the others, okay, what I want you to do is go away and come up with uh, a sign that represents you. And supposedly they were gonna to go to Koch's Book of Signs. Uh, others went elsewhere. Um, but the basic interpretation, as I see it, of the signs is, is this. What has been called Zoso, which is um, Jimmy Page's sign, a lot of people have called it Zoso. Apparently, it, uh, according to Page, it doesn't say Zoso. The Z, with the uh, convoluted um, line at the bottom, which is an alchemic sign for Mercury, um, signifies Page's star sign. Um, he's a Capricorn ruled by Saturn. Um, the O and the S and the O, the, an O with a dot in is said to represent six, so, of course, so a lot of people have seized on this, that the S is a convoluted six, that it's 666. Um, but basically it's based around his star sign. The sign for Bonham is a lovely one, uh, the three interlocking circles, which um, apparently is the man-woman-child trilogy all life, man, woman, child. Um, the fact that it was used as the Ballantine's beer logo is an interesting one because uh, Bonzo's love of the booze is, is well documented and uh, I think he, he might have seen the Ballantine's beer logo. John Paul Jones' three ellipsoids with bound by a circle, the trinity bound by the circle, signifies confidence and um, confidence and competence, which is probably all about John Paul Jones, great arranger, great musician, very, very confident, very at one, very happy with his life. The sign for Robert Plant is a very interesting one, which is the circle of life and inside is a feather, which signifies the Egyptian goddess Mayat, um, who was a goddess of truth and justice, um, which is that apparently Plant wasn't a very good liar at any time, so he, he chose that. And of course the feather is the sign of the writer. They are the most popular versions of it. Uh, as to Zoso's uh, meaning, probably the real inner depth of it, only Jimmy Page knows. He was into his occult, he was into um, mysterious signs, folklore. Alistair Crowley is obviously, uh, he, he, he actually bought Bolskin House up in, um, on the shores of Loch Ness because it was owned by the great magician Alistair Crowley. Very strange. Very, very strange. <laughs> it was just all part of the Zeppelin mystique and I think they played it so well. And what was good about it is that their audience went with it. And even now, you walk down any high street and there's a Zoso t-shirt, you know. It, it obviously worked because whatever it was, whatever those four symbols were, and they were pretty, you know, ambiguous. You know, I don't think there was a game plan you know, it, it was just another typical Zeppelin mystique, uh, you know, and great fun and all part of building, you know, the image. But the image wasn't through multimedia, it wasn't through the internet, you know, none of those things existed. It was an album cover and it was Led Zeppelin. And if you knew that, you were in the club. If you didn't know it, you are out of the club. And it seemed to be more people wanted to be in the club. So there was, that was the idea, I think. Fortunately, we were in a position there to be able to say that this is what we want because, you know, we had actually, you know, attained the status whereby that album was going to sell a lot of albums. Not obviously not as many as, we didn't think it would sell as many as what it did, but we knew it was going to sell a lot, you know, because of, of the whole sort of vibe of the band and, you know, everything else. Well, what was the, uh, in Days of Vinyl, the second side of Led Zeppelin for? Some people thought it was... Um, a slight disappointment. I suppose there was a lot to live up to after the power of Stairway to Heaven. I mean, that could have been, as I said, it could have been an album track in itself, just a, you know, a whole 12-inch LP could have been Stairway to Heaven. But the second side of Led Zeppelin IV had certain delights which have kind of matured over the years. I think I've, I've grown to appreciate them more now. <laughs>
Actually, parts of Misty Mountain Hop are a little bit cheesy. The first half-time thing section to me feels almost a little bit twee in the melody. But this was Plant's lyric about, supposedly, about a gathering with hippies or a meeting with hippies in a park. Some say San Francisco, some say Hyde Park, uh, when they were busted by police for smoking dope. Uh, indeed, Robert Plant was a strong campaigner for pro-marijuana. Uh, and this may have been his stance against the anti-marijuana laws at the time. Yes, I was really out of my mind. It's a great riff. I had a kind of circular rhythm going to it. A lot of people tend to think that it, it, it's one of the tracks to skip when listening to the album, but actually the leaning on the seventh with the harmonies, those ascending harmony parts, uh, and following the A, G to E riff are actually quite meaty. Um, and I think the harmonies are pretty clever, which is probably where John Paul Jones stepped in to direct them as to how they would move. Um, it's a solid song, um, it's probably the only uh, overt drug song on the whole album. Um, and I don't think it's any deeper than that, really. And, and on, on three, you had sort of, you know, um, mandolins and dulcimers. You know, have you done yeah. anything different on, on your new album? Um, there's about there's, uh, two, two tracks with acoustic. Yeah. Uh, going to California, that's mandolin again and yeah. acoustic guitar. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just sort of um, songs that, we're, you know, that we write and do at the particular time that an album, you know, we, and we say, right, we're going to put them an album out. Mm. And we, you know, we do the songs that we were, that we were writing at that particular time, so the next one will probably be different still, you know. Yeah. Made up my mind, making you start for me, California with an AQ. In my heart Someone told me there's a girl out there With love in her eyes and flowers In her hair Going to California was actually recorded outside sitting on the lawn You know, the, the mandolin there, it's a great vibe yeah, I think you can actually hear a plane going over at one particular point. That lovely droning D sound, it's a, it's a beautiful song, it's the, the melody is absolutely lovely. Uh, and by their admission, it was written as an homage to Joni Mitchell, the Lady of the Canyon. Um, the Lady They Seek. Uh, it, it's all about, uh, jo Robert Plant has said that he was in love with Joni Mitchell. Well, obviously he means in the artistic sense, but she captivated people like that. My chances on a big jet plane Never let them tell you that we're all, all the same Going to California was something that all bands did anyway in the 70s and still do. You know, it's great when you are a new young band, you want, you want to get away from all the, the dark cold of Europe, the wet weather and the, <laughs> the climate. So going to California sort of represents uh, Nirvana or the, uh, you know, sort of paradise in a way. But oddly enough, I believe the lyrics were actually inspired by slightly more doomy thoughts about the possibilities of earthquakes. I think they were thinking originally about the, the possibility of an earthquake in California, going to California, but it kind of transpired or transmogrified into a piece uh, more in tune with the, the hippie West Coast sort of Joni Mitchell vibe, rela relaxed, laid-back, romantic music, which was a, yet another facet of what Led Zeppelin were all about. The sunshine, the women, the whole culture, um, the laid-back attitude, it, it seduced young English rock musicians um, and let's be honest they they really do owe it to their success in America they were gods in America long before they became gods over here they owe pretty much all of their success to how how the, how they built this relationship with the American audiences from the constant touring and the epicenter of their love of America was California 
Led Zeppelin were an English band who America took to their heart. And well, what are you going to do? You know, two month tour in America or a 15 day in England, like Sheffield City Hall or, you know, whatever. There was nothing big that a band could, could go on to. Whereas you go to America and you're talking about 20,000, 12,000. They beat the Beatles record at Shea Stadium, which I think was about 58,000. You know, these, these, are, these are numbers of people that paying cash on the night is going to result in a very nice dinner afterwards. Are you a smash over here as well as over there? As much of? Well, there's more people here. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, therefore, it's a, you know, it's a proportional difference, really. It's probably the same, but on a different scale here. Did you expect this kind of um, uh, appreciation of, your, of what you do? Well, not to begin with, because not to this extent. No. We knew we were appreciated by the fact that people were coming along to see us in such great, vast numbers all over the place, England and the continent and wherever. But no one expected this. I think when Led Zeppelin IV burst on the scene and it was reviewed by critics and the public and accepted by the public, I don't think they or the band thought of this as kind of a pointer necessarily to some new future. This was representing all the, the best they could do at that point in time. It hinted that there were more grandiose things to come. When you listen to When the Levee Breaks, it hints at tracks that were to come later, like Kashmir, Physical Graffiti, which remains my favourite ever Zeppelin track. Led Zeppelin were, were nearing their, their peak, really. They were sort of, they'd been in the game for a few albums now, and they'd kind of grown into a style of their own. And I don't think we could really see where it was going to go next, but um, it was certainly a progression and something that sounded very Led Zeppelin. This was the halfway mark maybe the high water mark in some respects, because although they did great albums later, Houses of the Holy had some terrific moments, and uh, people talk now about Physical Graffiti, the big double album, as, as a, a milestone. But really, Physical Graffiti only had two or three real standout tracks as a double album. A lot of it was kind of filling, really. Um, it wasn't uh, nearly as coherent as, as Zeppelin IV. It wasn't a concept album, but the emotions you've gone through from Black Dog onwards, and then you've suddenly got this spiralling track at the end, this, this huge outpouring of blues emotion. What a way to end an album. And it ends with an echo. And it's an echo that says, I want to hear that again. The secret of a lot of this is the fact of where it was recorded. You cannot talk about When the Levee Breaks without talking about that drum sound, which is one of the most sampled sounds in history. Everybody from Ice-T to Puff Daddy, Chemical Brothers, the Beastie Boys got into trouble over sampling it. It is monumental. There is no drummer can play that groove like John Bonham did. No one hit the snare drum harder and nowhere do you hear a snare drum being hit as hard as that opening salvo to that track. And what happened is while the rest of the band were at the pub one night at Headley Grange, Andy Johns and himself took delivery of a new drum kit that had just arrived and with Headley Grange being on three stories, they set the kit up in the massive ground floor hallway. And the microphone, the stairway is leading up all the way round, you know, the stairwell, so to speak. And the microphone is one stereo mic coming out sort of one and a half floors up above the kit. And the results were fed through um, Jimmy Page's Echoplex echo unit with the result that you get that huge drum sound. The, the thing of the, the ambience, you know, we'd start He's starting now to go the whole hog, you know. Plus, in his absolute element, you know, he wants to be Robert Johnson. Well, on that track, he was. You know, the whole chemistry of Zeppelin as a blues band is all there on that track. That menacing, slow, plodding groove, it's, it just works. It works wonderfully. A 
a blues band on their own terms, not retro. You know, they took the blues and put it into the 70s and it still sounds great, you know, in the noughties. You know, it just does. It's got, it's got the kitchen sink in there, isn't it, Levy? And when the Levy breaks, that was a riff that, you know, that, uh, that, I, that I had written round the, the original Levy breaks, so to speak. Uh, but as far as the recording of it goes, the idea was to bring in something new on each verse. Every time it's, it's something new. Led Zeppelin were good at using influence, and the influence of the blues was paramount from Zep 1. I think with Levy, it matured again to a point where they could use an old blues track, which it was. They'd nixed Memphis Minis version, um, which was recorded in 27, I believe, uh, and made it very much their own. This is, this is Zeppelin blues absolutely at its best. Strap on their own sound to it, and again, that sound was built out of Bonham's drumming, and Page's guitar on that album, on that track, is just unbelievable. It, it zips across the speakers, you know, and really jumps out of you. And obviously the Bonham drum sound at the beginning. But apparently it's just used everywhere. And, you know, great harmonica, great song, um, great break in the middle, and great, great end. There's also a very spooky kind of uh, feeling about uh, when the levee breaks. And of course at the time, in England, people didn't really know what a levee was. It didn't have any great significance what is a levy you know unless you live in new orleans you wouldn't know and now of course when the levy breaks takes on new significance certainly for the the city of new orleans but uh obviously uh these levies had been breaking a lot of times <laughs> back in the past if they were writing about it back in the 1920s it had this uh, apocryphal feel about it you know the big flood was coming when the levy breaks and uh i suppose really uh that kind of sums up Zeppelin's uh, future in a way. There was this uh, feeling of power building up behind a dam and something about to break. So Led Zeppelin 4 ends on this rather menacing hypnotic note. Mm -hmm.